Remember the record this time? Classic. <laughs> Classic. All right. So, uh, for though, so everybody except for my dad, Mike Heisman, uh, was not on the last one. He's joining us. Um, joining. And then uh, Curtis, uh, who is a friend um, and fellow man on the frontier, um, is also joining us. Uh, philosopher by nature. Um, so the we had left off on uh, Kanto three, very beginning of Kanto three, um, and we had kind of just gone through the all caps entrance. We talked about you know this like very ominous words. Of, I'm uh, I am the way into the city of woe, the way into eternal pain, the way to go among the lost. And then we talked a little bit about how this concept of justice caused my high architect to move in this idea that. Um, in a strange sort of way, there's this Dante's making the statement that hell itself was was created by God, um, and this idea of like, uh, can we even really have justice? Capital J justice, the idea of justice in its pure form, if people don't receive what they gave. Um, so that's kind of, and then, and then obviously the very last line above the gates there, abandon all hope, you who enter here. So what we learn, what we learn here, like ultimately, this is a theme that's going to follow us the rest of the inferno. It, um, it's a poem about hope and the lack thereof in the inferno. So we, we're going to need to like kind of keep that in mind. Um, now, uh, one of the pieces of feedback. Um, that I received after the last class, and I think it's actually a great piece of feedback, um, especially as we start to try to cover more contos. I want to make sure that we have more room and space for group discussion um, to sort of enter into uh, what this class is. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to, the points that are in the outline, I'm going to touch on those briefly. But if at any point in this, I'm going to pause and ask a few questions kind of throughout and look for a little bit of discussion. Um, but at any point, I'm gonna do a better job also of paying attention when people raise their hands um, and, and kind of calling on you. Uh, if you have just an observation or something that, you know, maybe something that's like click uh, as we're talking, uh, please feel free to chime in and make this a collaborative thing. Um, so the, we did talk also last time, after, uh, Bob, you, you had mentioned, if you remember, uh, I think it was when we were talking about these doubts that Dante was having in second Canto about making the trip at all and how like, um, you know, thinking eats away our enterprises and, and, and how that's, a, it's, it's sort of this foreshadowing of the people we meet in this vestibule of the inferno who are stung into motion. And so that's, that's sort of the first folks that we meet in the inferno after they pass through the gates. So we look to, um, if we look, let's go to line 36. So the first people is, you know, he asked, Dante asked Virgil in, in line 33, he says, who are these people conquered by their pain? And Virgil to Dante says, this state of misery is clutched by those sad souls whose works in life merited neither praise nor infamy. And then we, we, we kind of find out uh, in 64 that, uh, the description is these worthless wretches who have never lived were pricked to motion now perpetually by flies and wasps that stung their naked limbs. And so they're, they're, it kind of does raise this question of they're in this vestibule. It's not even limbo. They're not in the inferno. They're not in purgatory. They're not in paradise. So they're these lukewarm people. Um, heaven doesn't want them because their presence would pollute heaven and the purity that exists there, but hell also doesn't want them um, because their presence would introduce, uh, it, it isn't, they aren't totally, um, something about them is not dark enough for hell. And so I, this is, this is, we're just going to, I just want to jump into kind of some group discussion right here of like, what is it about inaction in life that makes Dante put them in this vestibule? Like, I, and also, just even from a personal perspective, um, if you're if you had to sort of like rank sins like Dante is doing or rank um, faults, what is it about inaction that is bad? What makes inaction bad? 
because you're not actively doing anything. You're not harming anybody. You're simply just refusing to act. Desmond. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking it's kind of like uh, water that just sits for a long time, just kind of just kind of sits there and it doesn't really, it just kind of rots. So you don't really want to drink it because it's like, there's there's no motion to it. So it's almost like something that's, if you're not doing any action at all, you're just kind of sitting there rotting. So you don't, there's no energy there. So you don't really want to be a part of that. Something like that. Yeah. John, do you have something? Yeah, I was going to say, um, like passiveness or inaction can indirect or indirectly cause problems or not alleviate them. You know, like, I guess like a father to their children, if they're just like super passive or don't pay attention. Yeah. They're not directly causing harm to them, but at the same time they are causing harm to them because they're not providing their guidance or wisdom or love or whatever it might be. And that water example is interesting because like water, when it's flowing, we see it in our blood, like it needs to be constantly flowing. So it's like a theme that is seen in nature too. It's like the activity is the life. The activity is the, the goodness. Um, but yeah, that, that would just be an example of it. Yeah. And then, and then obviously kind of, if we're familiar with the Bible, there's a line in revelation about, um, I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you could be cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And so I think that's, that's sort of, I think what Dante is thinking about here in the context of why he places these people inactive in life in this vestibule. Um, but it, it's also something, gosh, of course. Yeah. Sorry. I just admitted Josh. Um, yeah, it just it just makes for uh it's something I, I think about often actually. Um and I and I I wonder if Dante was maybe haunted by this like I am, of to what extent is it, you know, it creates this uh anxiety that you're not doing enough. Right. Um and so that can that to what extent is that a healthy feeling to where um that spurs you to action, that shame that you feel, if you feel like you're not doing enough, and, to, and where does that become unhealthy? I think it's, that's something we have to grapple with, um, especially when we see these souls and think about them being like stung into motion. I don't have an answer there, um, but Kurt, Curtis, you got some, what do you think? Well, you look like you got some yeah. on Yeah, I was writing it down. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. So, the first thing that kind of came to mind was like magnets. Um, I think there's like these poles of what I think is the idea of like heaven and hell. Like you want to be on a pole and I think of like life and calibrating from back and forth. You kind of get to where you're going quicker by going through it. So like if you're always in the middle, then you're never going to learn the lesson of wherever you're going in life. That's kind of like what I think. So you you go here and then you go here, but if you stay in the middle too much, then you're not really going anywhere. That's that's my thoughts. I see you, Dad. You know there's a button you can press. <laughs> you wave your hand. You raise your hand like a good. No, uh, you're also on mute. There. Now I got to figure it out. So it's really he's not saying that they made bad decisions, it's that they made no decision to no. go either direction. And he can live with bad decisions, but no decision is even worse. Kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also think of like, uh, you guys are familiar with the really great runner, uh, Prefontaine. He has this line of, to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice this gift. And that's kind of how I think about it is like we were given this divine gift. We have this divine birthright and to not make the most of it is to, in some way, dishonor the gift or do it a disservice. Um, but I don't want to spend too much time on this one point because we have a lot to get through today. So the one other thing I do want to mention, we, we already talked about how this is a poem about hope. And so I, I think it's worth, how many of you are familiar with uh, the myth of Sisyphus, either the actual Greek myth or the book by Albert Camus, besides Curtis? So, okay, so um, the myth of Sisyphus, Sisyphus is the Titan and his punishment in Tartarus 
is he's forced to push a boulder uphill and when he gets to the top it goes back down and he has to push it all the way back up to the top and he just repeats that cycle over and over again albert camus uh, philosopher from the early 1900s uh sort of used the myth of sisyphus in an essay of the same name where he talks about um, our state as human beings being like sisyphus where we like sisyphus are destined to hopelessly roll this boulder uphill for all of our lives. Now, Camus also talked about this idea of the absurd, um, the absurd referring to this idea that uh, he, he thought human existence was absurd because we have a natural inclination to seek meaning in what he thought was a universe devoid of meaning. And so Camus' universe is one without the theological virtue of hope, hopelessness. We think about the spirit of our current age. Nihilism comes from uh, nihil, is Latin for nothing. And so there is this sort of idea of nothingness. So when we're saying abandon hope, you who enter here, and in a lot of ways, we might think about sort of in the lens of our modern culture and the spirit of nihilism, of us sort of putting ourselves, we don't, we don't need, we may not even need an external hell because we've made a hell of ourselves in giving up hope. Um, and so that that's where it's worth sort of thinking about uh, if we remove that as a virtue, if we remove hope um, and sort of just continue to allow ourselves to wallow in something like nihilism, um, that puts us in Dante's hell. So it's that's sort of like worth thinking about, I think, psychologically. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any reactions to that. But uh, I just want us to kind of keep that in mind. Again, we're going to keep circling back to hope. The um, I want to go forward to lines one twelve. So this, if if thinking eating away the enterprise and kind of choose my favorite image, this is my second favorite image. And so this is just this is right after Dante and Virgil encounter souls in what I call Hell's Lobby or the vestibule, and they come to a river. We talked about this a little bit. They, they come to a river uh, where they cross over into hell proper and they separate themselves um, from divinity entirely. So this is the past the point of no return. So in line in lines 112, it says, as in the fall when leaves are lifted off, one drops another till the naked branch sees all its garments lying on the earth. So the bad seed of Adam one by one toss them shells themselves from the shore at Karin's sign as hawks returning to the master's call. Now, if you remember who his guide is, Virgil, uh, this is also him paying homage to a line in uh, Virgil's Aeneid, where uh, Virgil makes a, a very similar, uh, he uses this metaphor also of leaves falling from a tree to describe souls in the underworld. And so if we think, of, if we think about this again, going in, in the context of, we talked a little bit about telos and the end of human beings in the first class. So if we, if we think about that again in this context, um, if, if you say, for instance, you know, the, the end of an acorn is an oak tree. Uh, along those same lines we talked about, you take Dante's view, the end of man is God, right? So in that same way, you might, you might see God as the full flourishing of this tree uh, of which we are, we are kind of have this seed. We, the human being, is the seed meant to sort of grow toward and be reunited eventually with God. Um, C.S. Lewis has a has a line about um, modern man being the branches that rebel against the tree, and so thereby cutting themselves off from the source of life. So what Dante is illustrating here poetically is he says, as as in the fall when leaves are lifted off, one drops another till the naked branch sees all its garments lying on the earth. So this this goes to what we were talking about. This is the, the the souls as they enter hell are cutting themselves off from the source of life. And so that is also how they're cutting themselves off from hope. Because if you view the world hierarchically like Dante does, then what he's saying here is that the, the relationship, their ability to ascend, the natural desire to ascend towards God, they can no longer do, which is why they're in eternal misery um, when they're falling off the tree, the tree sort of representing God here. Um, and so that with with that, they, you know, he he sort of watches the um, he watches the folks. Uh, put themselves in Karin's boat, boat, and then they get shut off into hell. Uh, and then we move into Canto 4. And then Canto, Canto 4 is where it's just 
it gets a little convoluted, but uh, we move into limbo. Limbo is different than the vestibule, but it's still not really sort of uh, the hell of uh, fire and uh, um, suffering that we're used to. And so in, in um, here, it, it, it's also, we also need to draw a distinction and I'll ask you about why you think, actually, I'll just ask right now. Um, what do you think the difference is between, we won't get to purgatory, but what do you think the difference is between purgatory and limbo? Does anybody have a guess? Uh, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, purgatory, purgatory, I think what maybe they, there's some things that they may have done that would have put them in purgatory. So it's like, Oh, you're not super, super bad to go to hell. Well, you, we're going to send you to purgatory first to see if we can fix it. But then limbo is just like you, you, um, what you haven't been baptized at all. So we can't put you in purgatory because you don't even deserve to go to purgatory yet because you didn't pass that thing. There's no wrong answers here. Don't oh, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have an idea? Sean. I was going to say <clears throat> purgatory, there's still a chance to go up to heaven where limbo, it's like the perpetual, like limbo, you're in limbo. I don't know if that's. It is. Follow-up question. What what distinguishes somebody in limbo or purgatory? Oh, uh, what? Uh, wasn't it uh, the, the belief? Baptism? Or... Like the belief that there is a God or... Um, was it that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's as good as guess as any, to be honest. He doesn't really give us an answer to it. Um, he kind of hints at this idea of it's, it's people sort of existing either before the revelation of Christ or uh, people that didn't um, accept sort of the, the coming of Christ uh, versus it seems to me, we won't get to purgatory again, but it seems to me that the souls in purgatory are people who just fell short. Um they just they they had the belief they had the mind right, um, and they just they gave way to temptation too much, and now it needs to be purged out of them. That's what purgatory is. It's the place of purging the sin that's in their soul. But they had the right heart and right intention. Curtis, what do you got for me? Yeah, I I was gonna. I mean, I guess piggybacking off of that, I was say limbo pe limbo people are like kind of asleep to their vices. And like purgatory is like the precursor to heaven. Um, that's like what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So the um, another thing that we learn here, and this is, um, so that that let's go to line thirty three. Uh, so yeah, this is this is they're talking about the souls that they're seeing. They're seeing here, and, and he says, and if they lived before the Christian faith, they did not give God homage as they ought. And of these people, I myself am one. This is Virgil talking to me. Like, I'm, I'm in limbo. Um, for such a falling short and for no crime, we are all lost. And I suffer only this. Hopeless. There again, they had to abandon hope. Hopeless. We live forever in desire. Now, the point I want to make here is, is uh, one that's near and dear and close to my own heart. So the if the my first book, an introduction to philosophy. I've I've always been somebody that loves stoicism, and so among the souls that Dante meets here in Limbo um, are you know, there Cicero, Roman orator. You got Seneca, the Roman Stoic, Virgil, his guide, obviously great Roman poet. Ovid and Homer are great Greek poets. Um, Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato. So to represent all of these figures to Dante represent the highest that humans could get without divine revelation. So there's this idea of like the, um, they're, that's why they're called the virtuous pagans is they do, they represent as good as it can get um, without that revelation of Christ as Dante saw it. And so because, because they didn't have that full and complete revelation, they're lost forever without hope. They're, they were without hope forever lost in desire. This is why my personal thesis um, in the same way that there was a natural progression from sort of Greek to Rome to the idea of Stoicism. And then there's there's a bridge from that to Christianity because Christianity fills a gap that uh, all the best Greek, Roman, and Stoicism can't fill. And so I, we've seen a, uh, this is again, my personal thesis, we've seen a rise in Stoicism 
recently, thanks to Ryan Holiday and others. And I think that that is sort of this preparation of there's going to be a next step because stoicism does lack something. It lacks a certain divine quality. Um, it can get you to baseline. It can help you navigate chaotic environments, but it doesn't have a promise of anything greater or higher um, than that. And so that that's a that's it's I I that was a a shift for me um, in how I viewed stoicism. Uh, honestly, was when I when I read Dante changed my mind. I guess uh, on uh, opened my eyes to the incompleteness of it as a philosophy. I still love stoicism to this day, but it's incomplete in my view. Um, I don't know if anybody disagrees with me or has a reaction to what I just said or um, thinks I'm just flat wrong. But if not, we'll just we'll continue marching on. The truth goes marching on, as they say. All right. Um, so, I, I, you know, I don't want to spend too much. That, that's kind of all I really had for, um, well, one more point. This is just, I want to get you guys' take on this. So in, in line 97, he talks about, he comes to all these great stoic people. And so he says, uh, you know, when they had talked together for a while, they turned to me and beckoned me to come, bringing a smile into my teacher's lips. And he greeted me and honored me so well. And they included me among their band and made me sixth in that academy. What he's saying here is he's the sixth best poet that ever lived. And so is this, that, like, how, how do we feel about this? Is this Dante being cocky? Is this proper? What is the difference between, you know, if we go back to Aristotle and the idea of mag magnanimous man or big souled man, Aristotle says a requirement of that man is that he has a certain amount of confidence. A man that lacks confidence cannot be a magnanimous man. I say this as somebody who struggles with this a lot. How do you thread the needle between um, confidence and cocky? I don't, that's something I don't have an answer for. And if one of you has an answer for it, I would love to hear it. But Dante here is walking that line because he is saying um, some, you could say by putting himself six, he's being humble because he still put five people above him. But you could also be like, oof, pretty bold to write this before it was ever read by anybody. But he called his shot. This is like Babe Ruth calling a home run. So this is like, I, do we have any, what do we think about this? How do we feel about Dante Dante putting himself sixth in this academy? Desmond. Uh, I, don't, I remember Tyra Banks one time said on America's Next Top Model, not that I watched that show, but she said, don't dull your shine. She, she would always tell the models that whenever they would like kind of say, oh, you know, I'm not that good. She's like, oh, you shouldn't dull your shine. You know, you should always like own it. Like even if, if it means being a little cocky about it, just be cocky, just own. So I think maybe he's like taking pride in the fact that he is, he does think he's a good poet, which is okay. I mean, even if it does come off as a little cocky, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like some of the people that I do look up to. They're they have like a little bit of overconfidence, or uh, you know, they're not like humble. I don't know, like people that I think of, like Judge Judy. You know, she knows she's the shit. Hmm. She's like a multi millionaire, and she's like she owns that. She's just like she runs the place. You know, it's like okay. Well, I guess that's this is the this is the question. Um, I think is is. One, like, to what extent do we owe a duty to, is, to what extent is it, is it depend on internal intention and desire? And to what extent is it, do we have a duty to think about or worry about how other people perceive us? Like, what is the, like, is, I think that there are situations where we can act confident and in integrity, but be perceived by other people as cocky in a ways that has nothing to do with us and everything to do with them. And so it is this weird, it's a weird sort of, and we'll get to this later when we get to the suicides in Conte 13, when he says, I think that he thought that I thought, whereas human beings, we play this weird game where we think based off of what we think somebody else thinks that we think. And so we're constantly guessing like the unknown and trying to plan our actions based on what we think other people think and what we think they think we think. And so it's this weird circular sort of maze that's just part of being human, um, which I just, I, I think that the, I, I, I thought, I always thought this was interesting that he puts himself six in this band. So I had to, I had to mention it um, before we move on. So now we come to uh, Canto 5. 
So in Tonto 5, um, now this is real. This is hell, hell. Um, and what the first thing we meet uh, in hell proper is Minos. Um, and, and he is sort of the person that is responsible for sending people to their proper circle. So uh, if you're familiar with um, like Egyptian mythology, I don't know why, but I've always loved the the visual of having your soul weighed against a feather. Um, and then if you're, if you're, if your soul weighs more than that feather, if it's, if it's not light enough, it's kind of reminds me of like, uh, camels won't pass through eyes of needles. Like if you're carrying too much of the world, you, you don't, you're not allowed entry anyway. And so the, they come to mind, the souls, the souls die, uh, they go to hell and they kind of come to this platform uh, of Minos and, and in line four, you know, he talks about horrible Minos grunts like a bull, weighs all the sins. So this is the idea of like your soul weigh more than a feather. Weighs all the sins and sends the wicked down according to how far he winds his tail. So somebody comes in, Minos weighs them, say spins his tail nine times, then they go among the traitors where you find uh, Judas and Satan. Um, that's just the instant. And so the the also in a weird sort of way, the souls, when they go there, this is line seven. I mean that when one born in evil hour appears before him, he confesses all and then judge Minos, the sin connoisseur, discerns what place in hell is fit for him, belts himself with his tail as many times as there are grades the sinner must descend. Ever before him stands a crowd of souls. They step up one by one to testify. They speak and hear and then are formed below. So that's a weird it's a weird thing that's happening here. Why do we think? Why do we think they confess all before Minos? Why is Why is Minos the judge here, not God? Like, who Who is the judge that sends them to hell in the first place? Like, how How does What do we think? Why do we think Dante does this? Is it like a default? Like, right. what's they die? What's that, Curtis? I think maybe, maybe he's not ready for God's judgment. Maybe it's like there needs to be like another tier before like divine judgment. Desmond? I was thinking was it like a default, like um almost like you know, like when you go like throw something in the trash, it automatically goes to recycling or it goes to the uh the landmine. Yeah, I so this, I don't have an answer for this. This is kind of a trick question. I, I like offered you guys into a trap. This is a, a like one of those like uh, plot gaps uh, that I don't think is really answered. It's like we don't we don't know we don't know why like who judges them before they're judged by Minos. Um, we don't have any insight into that. But the reason he chooses Minos in this situation, we do know that is based on uh, so Minos as a figure was the king of Crete and he was kind of known for his wisdom. Um, in the pagan world, he's kind of like the equivalent of Solomon, you know, until, of course, he fails to sacrifice a bull back to Poseidon, and then the Minotaur is created and creates that whole episode. But there is a sort of in the legend, Minos is known for his wisdom. So you could think about him like the uh, pagan version of Solomon. Um, and so that is why he is sort of put in charge of being the sin connoisseur. Uh, so that's that's what we get when we get minus. Um, the so after after their encounter with minus, and they move into uh, the realm of the lust fault. And so this is sort of the first real uh, band of um, sin, I guess, that we see. Uh, so in this circle, he sees the souls caught up in a relentless wind, and that sort of like blows them all about. Uh, in the same way that their lustful desires move them in life. So if we if we look at line 31, he says, that hellish cyclone that can never rest snatches the spirits up in its driving whirl, whisks them about and beats and buffets them. And when they fall before the ruined slope, ah, then the shrieking, the laments, the cries, then they hurl curses at the power of God. I learned that such a torment was designed for the damned who are wicked in the flesh, who made their reason subject to desire. So this is a theme of every sin. Um, 
in the inferno, which is sort of our first look at it. He says they made their reason subject to desire. So this is where uh, Dante betrays his loyalty to the ancient Greek world and their love of the logos. That is reason, man's ability to reason as the divine capacity and capability within man. And so what Dante is saying here is that what vice is, what lands somebody in, his, in hell is when um, basically they, they betray their, the divinity, the higher, the reason uh, in favor of the flesh. When they let the flesh call the shots, that is sort of all of these sins, all of these souls in hell are guilty of that thing. And then it's just a matter of uh, in, in what um, in what circle that they end up. Now, there is a, a weird, random, open question that we kind of have to speculate. Another one that we have to speculate on, and it's like, well, how do we? How does it? How does it? In all likelihood, the souls that are in Conto or that are in the Circle Two, we're probably guilty of some other things also, right? We're not all like. All of us struggle with all of the vices. All of us do all of the things. So it does cause it raises this question of, well, is it the is it the one that they struggle with the most? Is it the predominant one, or um, you know what determines why one would go to two versus three if both of them were in them? Um, and we don't really get an answer to this question from Dante. So this is another one we're sort of forced to speculate on. So I don't I don't know. Um, I don't have a great answer for this. Like why, if it's the the best I can offer is that um, I think I think Dante might say it's like it's it's their predominant. It's the it's if Minos weighs their heart, it's the one that weighs the heaviest. I I, I think that's the best we can do. Um, Sean. Yeah, I have a thought on that. It's interesting how he put it as a circle, right? And a circle has no starting point necessarily. And when you see in life, a lot of things like live in these cycles, either a vicious or virtuous cycle. And one thing can get you into that cycle. And then that cycle can lead to all the other vices, right? So maybe it is that like one thing, like the lust, the, you know, the gluten, whatever it might be that leads you into the cycle in the first place that's causing you to be in this perpetual loop of pain um i don't know but just the yeah. thought it's a good thought curtis you're smiling like you have something i just like what he said <laughs> there you go desmond oh uh, yeah it's, it's always like a conversation starter that i always when i meet new people i ask them what their vice is just to kind of get to know them so a lot of people are like oh you know what my vice is drinking or smoking or you know whatever yeah. one thing you have that like kind of you're always working on like I surely has mine. I mean, I have my own vices like sugar yeah. and something else that I won't mention on here. But yeah, yeah, it's always like things were so I guess whatever is like the most thing, like, oh, you really this guy's like a an alcoholic, so he's like gluttony is like his vice or yeah. Yeah. The um the other thing uh I guess to to, to mention here also as we sort of move into uh the various punishments of the various rings um earlier i, I, I think is in content three i can't remember the exact line but dante talks about how he, he's looking at these i think it might be actually in the vestibule he's looking at the souls in hell and they're they're bent over they're and so there again there's this idea that they're not allowed to look up and so they're they're sort of like bent over they're crushed under the weight of their sin and so let me go back to this idea of the weight the weight of what they're carrying, um, which again uh, sort of reinforces this idea that uh, the 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 vice they they gave way to in life becomes its own type of hell, its own type of punishment that that makes them crooked. Uh, when they want to be the flower that sends itself, reaches itself upward, they sort of like bend and uncreate uh, and make themselves crooked by giving way to these things and letting these desires call the shots and rule sort of their, their actions um, in life. And we, we see there's also another aspect of every soul in hell. And we see that when we get to um, Francesca and Paolo, uh, who are the two lovers that we see um, in 
Compo 5. So if we go to, let's go to line 127. So there's a lot going on here, but basically what happens is Dante should be two souls swirling around, and he says to Virgil, he's like, hey, I really want to talk to these two souls. Um, and so he called them over, and it turns out that uh, they were lovers in life, and they sort of like give this account of their affair. And the whole time that Dante's talking to the souls, it's always, it's always, they fail to take responsibility. Like every other soul in hell, it's never their fault. It's always God's fault. So they're saying, you know, love, Francesca has described me, saying, love made me do it. God is not my friend. Uh, and then, you know, they're talking about how um, the thing that made them fall prey to their lust was they were reading uh, a book in the Arthurian legend. So this is when we this is when we get to uh, line one twenty seven. Uh, it says, uh, "One day we two were reading for delight about how love had mastered Lancelot. We were alone and innocent and felt no cause to fear. As we read, at times we went pale as we caught each other's glance, but we were conquered by one point alone. For when we read that much longed for smile, accepted such a gentle lover's kiss, this man who nothing will divide from me trembled to place my lips upon his mouth." A pander was that author in his book. So they're blaming, blaming the author in the book, not themselves. That day we did not read another page. And all the while, one spirit told their tale, the other wept so sadly that I fell for pity of it to a death-like faint. And I dropped like a body stripping back. So this is where one of the first Francesca blames God and love. And then they blame the author. And so there's a failure, there's the failure of a lack of, of taking responsibility here for sin. And this is something you see sort of uh, throughout the, the, the inferno. Now, I, I mentioned last class, when when, when Dante, the, the second to last line, 141, for pity of it, I so sadly that I fell for pity of it. So we learn here that Dante, why, why does Dante have pity? So he's having pity, he's having pity for souls and in, in Hell, who are supposed to have seen received just punishment. That's the whole purpose of this thing. But he's he's he sees pity and it's sadness because, like we talked about last time, he sees himself in these two. He sees his own tendency. Like he's making this journey because of Beatrice, his love of his life. That's the whole reason he's doing this in the first place. And so he is he is a lover. Um, and so he sees the punishment of these two, which he you know. He places them in the highest ring of hell, but at the same time, he sees something that he himself uh, is at risk of doing. He sees a potential place he might end up um, because he recognizes uh, he shares a lot of these um, loving qualities. Like the, the, and so he has pity for it, and so we'll, he'll throughout the inferno slowly he will move. Um, he, he'll he'll have pity for a few more souls, and eventually. Uh, you know, Virgil basically tells him, teaches him a long way. He's like, you got to stop having pity for these things because the education of your soul is like, it requires the knowledge that their punishment here is just. And so if their punishment here is just, you cannot pity them. And so that's like this slow educational process that Virgil has to take Dante through before he can get to purgatory, before he can ascend. So Dante himself has to see all the way down to hell in order to himself be sort of granted ent entry into uh, the ascension ter territory. Um, so the the from there we move into Canto Six. In Canto Six, uh, this is where we um, we see Cerberus, we had a dog. Uh, if you're familiar with Harry Potter, honestly, you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of figures <laughs> in Dante. Uh, and in like all the ancient Greeks and Romans in their poems um, that J.K. Rowling like worked into her Harry Potter universe, and you know I don't I don't think it's an accident. I think she knew exactly what she was doing, and I think honestly that's why her works have been such a success because I think she hid really old symbols um, that people recognized um, and held in their memory uh, in ways that weren't immediately obvious to them, but they still felt drawn to. The same reason I think Tolkien and Lord of the Rings was incredibly successful. He kind of did the same thing. Um, anyway, so they, they kind of, they meet Cerberus. Uh, 
this is line 13, Cerberus, the bizarre and cruel beast with his three gullets barks like a great dog over the spirits drowning in that pace. Um, it's a, it's a, the, when we, when they enter the third ring, um, the important thing to note here is it's, this is line seven, where the rain falls eternally accursed, ponderous, cold, changeless, changeless in rhythm, changeless in quality. So this is the circle where we meet the gluttonous, um, the people who indulged, um, and again, sort of gave way to their bodily desires and tried to fill themselves up with pleasures of the flesh. Um, uh, and so that this is their, this is their punishment is they, there's this perpetual rain that flattens them and it's a cold and smelly rain. Um, and it turns their souls in too much. This, what do we, why do we think that happens? Why would, why would the gluttonous have their souls turned to mush by a perpetual rain? What does that, what does that, that possibly represent? All right, well, uh, Desmond, you have a guess? Uh, just to kind of wash away the achiness of them just being so gluttonous? To draw them out, maybe? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, at the, what I think it's happening here is it's kind of this slushy mix. So if we think about the soul as this pure thing, this light thing, and all of a sudden you enter into, again, go back to the idea that Minos weighs souls at the beginning of hell. And so when you give way to gluttony, you, all of a sudden you start to eat. And, and gluttony isn't just isn't just limited to food, but you start to consume things to try to fill you up. You start to pollute the soul, the purity of the soul. You're introducing sort of this mix. It's no longer a pure thing. So that's why it becomes this weird sort of slush. Um, and so it can't lift. It's weighty. It's heavy. And it's drawn downward. So that is that's what I think is happening here with, with why they're just pelted by endless rain and turned into slush. Um, and it kind of goes back to uh, this idea that when they enter hell, they have the cord of their telos cut. And this is this is a, the point I make in, in the outline. So um, when, he, when, when, when Dante sees the soul as a polluted mix of slush for the sin of gluttony, he, Dante turns to Virgil and he asks them whether they will always be in such a state. And so when he when when Virgil gives his answer, he directs Dante towards. He basically says, "Remember, remember what you know from your study of Aristotle and philosophy that things feel more pleasure pleasure when they are whole or nearer their end, and they feel more pain when they are separated from their end." This is the whole structure of the inferno. Generally, um, the further they are from their end, again viewing God as the end further they are separated from it, the further they sent themselves away from that and they are out of uh, alignment with that thing, the more they suffer, the lower they are in hell. So this is it, 109, uh, when he says, for all these accursed folk cannot come to their true perfection in man's end. They look to be more perfect than, than now. So um, this, is, again, characterizes all the souls that we meet in hell, uh, but it's just, this is just sort of another example where, where Dante gives us a little more color on the philosophy that underpins this whole uh, entire work. Um, so the we're cooking along. We got about 15 minutes left, so I think we're going to do it. The uh, Canto 7. So the um, when we get to Canto 7, this is where uh, it's the fourth circle. We're in the fourth circle. And this is where the, the, the souls that suffer from avarice and prodigality, uh, which are two things that are, um, I personally had to look up the the, the definition of avarice. Uh, does anybody know what, what avarice means or refers to? Extreme greed. Um, now, prodigality is another one. So in this one, was I don't think I ever knew this, because for those of you familiar with the Bible, there's the prodigal son. Um, and so that's, it's just spending large amounts of money. So this is, he meets, uh, he meets the avarice and then he also meets the misers and the squanderers. So he, two people on the opposite sides of the pole, the people that were reckless in spending and the people that were greedy and spent nothing, kept all their money for themselves. So he meets both of these extremes, 
Uh, and it's, it's basically to come down to people who uh, money was their master. Uh, money called the shots. Uh, money was the thing that they loved more than God. Um, and so he, Dante sees these two in a weird sort of uh, like perpetual uh, tug of war. He sees the two opposite extremes constantly butting heads. Um, and so this is this is where uh, I also just I, I love this. Um, in, in 26, we'll turn to line 26. I love this because it reminds me of some of Seneca. Seneca and Boethius, they talk about uh, to be enthroned is to be ensnared. And sort of the weight of wealth goes back to what I was talking about earlier. Like camel can't through, yeah, the, the camel will not pass through in the needle's eye and sort of the weight of attachment. So he sees the two, the two uh, types of souls butting heads and he says, um, line 28, they slammed those stones together front to front, then straight off to each side, turned about and yelled, why do you fritter? Why the fist so tight? So that's, that's, that, it's a call and response. So the, the, the miserly are saying, why do you fritter? Like, like, why do you spend carelessly? And then in response, they're saying, why are your fists so tight? And so they're constantly just at each other's throats, seeing only the vice in the other person. Again, they're incapable of taking responsibility or ownership over their own thing. All they all they can do is is fight and point out the vice of another. So that is that is a, that is a chief quality and characteristic of the souls in hell: is their inability to take responsibility and ownership. Um, the other the other piece that I that I love here is as as Dante and Virgil are talking about uh, sort of fortune in general, uh, both as like the concept of lady fortune and fortune in terms of wealth. Um, this is where there's a hyperlink to my favorite philosopher, who is Boethius, who wrote The Constellation of Philosophy. And this is in, in 64 and through 69. Um, Virgil's talking about how the souls that are here were never going to be happy. They were always going to be restless because what they had was never enough. They were always looking for more. And, and so... He says, for all the gold, this is line 64, for all the gold that lies beneath the moon and all that has could never give a moment of rest to one of these exhausted souls. My teacher, I said then, tell me this too. What is the fortune you have touched upon that holds the world's goods in so fierce a clutch? And he, oh, you are simpletons indeed. How deep the ignorance that injures you. I'll give you the bare truth that you may feed. He who is transcendent wisdom passes all, fashioned the heavens and gave each sphere a guide that every part might shine to every part, distributing the splendor equally. So what Virgil is saying here is it's like, the, this is another, he's pointing out another part of the human condition where we look on earth for what can only be found in heaven, what can only be found in God. Um, and so we seek in transient things, things that will never stay, um, to fill the emptiness that can't be filled anywhere on this earth. And so we're fools to look on this earth. That's what Virgil is telling Dante here. Um, so after 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 they sort of make these observations on uh, the folks that were focused too much on money, we get we get introduced to the wrath the wrathful um, who tear each other apart. So this is lines uh, starts on line one ten. Um, and I, who gazed intently as I stood, saw people in that sloth, all slimed with mud, stripped naked, and their faces torn with rage. They thumped each other, not with hands alone, but with their head, the chest, the feet, the teeth, snapping to rip each other limb from limb. So this is a pretty gnarly scene. Uh, they find these souls who were consumed by wrath. And this is another, this is another thing we're going to have to draw a distinction between a, a group of souls we see later um, who are the vengeful. And so the, it asks, this, it begs this question of what's the difference between wrathful and vengeful or angry? Um, it's a, it's a, it's a very sort of uh, nuanced, uh, nuanced thing that we'll talk about more about when we get to the the vengeful souls. But um, suffice it to say, for now, there is a what the souls are seeing here is is, you know, if you've ever if you've ever lost your temper. Um, there is a sense in which it does possess you. Um, you are sort of possessed by this thing. And so the, the, when the souls are, are in the wrathful, when they're ripping each other apart, this is, this is sort of Dante's poetic way of describing that it's, it's 
the wrath that possesses you, when you use that to rip others apart, you're actually ripping yourself apart. And so there's this cycle of um, if, 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 if we are sort of one and whole, is the idea of like what I do to you, I also in some ways do to myself. And so there's this like, there's this again, eye for an eye situation where the souls that are tearing are being torn at the same time in this weird sort of mosh pit of wrath and ripping. And um, it's a pretty nasty, weird scene, but uh, there are others um, that we're gonna get to that are a little more uh, graphic even than this. Um, so the, the one question I guess for discussion is um, what do we think about Dante punishing, having the punishment of the, the avarice and the prodigal and the miserly being like stuck in this constant state of pushing boulders into each other and, and fighting? Like why, that's one I, I, I don't know that I have an answer to, but um, any, any thoughts or guesses there why, why Dante chooses that for their punishment? Mike, you've been pretty quiet. What do you think? I don't know. You have given me so much. My brain is starting to get overloaded here. <laughs> uh, it's always a constant battle, though, between being too miserly versus the opposite. I mean, it's in your own personal life it's a struggle much less for example if you're married you know one person might be more the spender one person might be more the saver and so um i mean i can relate to that to a certain extent but in terms of why he chose that one i'm not really sure fair enough i think the key takeaway for me is is goes back to what we were talking about of um, a willingness to have your where you are falling short exposed, um, and and because that's that's what that's what we see in these two competing forces is the reason they're locked in this eternal battle is because neither one will ever give way, um, and and so that's it's an important reminder for me. And not only in this sense of in these vices specifically, but in all vices of, of being willing to hear hard truths and accept some sort of responsibility when I may be doing something too much. Um, because I, I think, you know, frugality can be a virtue if done in a healthy amount. And the question is, at what point does it slip into vice? Um, and that's something you have to rely on other people to help you with. Um, and so it's the willingness to sort of receive that feedback and uh, uh, look at yourself um, and um, contemplate where where they might be telling you something that does have a sliver of truth. Sean. Um, I think uh, for this punishment, like why it is, it, it kind of goes back to what we we're, were saying in the beginning of like, there needs to be this motion where those two things compete with each other. Like I, I'll put it back to the water analogy where you have one side, someone trying to hold all the water and block it and have a dam in the river. And then the other side is trying to take all the water for themselves. When the answer is you just got to let that water flow through. And I think these like rocks kind of resemble like that conflicting side of both those things that neither are right. And it just keeps this like, I want more water. No, I want to keep it here. Like weird dynamic of that same sin of like the the greed versus uh, storage or, or greed versus like, you know, spend it all and waste it. Kind of that that uh, same analogy type thing. Yeah, I, I, that's a great point. And it brings me back to the idea of thinking, eating away our enterprises also of like we can also hold both of these energies. And I'm guilty of this having both of these energies as sort of the dual devil. I don't know. I don't have a better, but like the two voices on our shoulder. And it's like when there's the dialogue and never any action, there's still stagnation. So that is, that is the equivalent of these two boulders, these immovable things just staying here and staying stuck. And so that, that's what I think it's representing 
is this idea of in the same way the boulder is stuck, we as people are stuck when we give way to this type of conflict. Um, when, when there is no sort of give and take or taking responsibility, we like the boulders are stuck, stagnant, um, and our psychological development is stunted in the same way these boulders aren't moving in any direction. I think you're 100% right. Um, so we got like two minutes. Uh, so this is Kanto 8. Uh, we'll just introduce this one. Um, so when we get to Kanto 8, uh, it's more of the wrathful, and we also see uh, the river Styx and then the city of the walls of the city of Dis. Um, so the, the first thing, uh, we'll just talk about sort of the river Styx real quickly. So um, in line 33, uh, I don't know how you say this guy's name. It's like Legius, Legius. That's the guy who ferries them across the river Styx. Uh, so it, um, as they cross the river Styx, they, they ride over the slime of souls. And this is still the wrathful souls sort of reach out of the water and they're like vengeful and they're trying to tear Dante down. They're trying to get him to join him in this like weird lake of ripping and tearing. Um, and they're, we see here kind of for the first time, like the souls in hell are upset that Dante is there before his time. There's like the secrets of, of, of hell. They don't want the secrets to get out to the world of the living. Um, it's kind of that misery loves company sort of idea. They don't want Dante to go back and tell people of this world that they're in. They want more people to join them so they feel better in some way about their own sort of state of misery. So when they when Dante meets this uh, Filippo Argenti in, across the river Styx, uh, he, he says in line 33, who are you to come before your hour? So he's pissed. Um, and, and when Dante tells him, tells him off, this is kind of the first time we see Virgil, who is actually proud of Dante for... Um, uh, telling him off. Uh, this is lines 46 through 51. Um, he said, the, the, so we've learned here that Filippo was that man on earth who was full of ignor ignorance. Um, no good or gracious deed, and so his shade is full of fury here. Um, and that, that's sort of how we, that's, that's Filippo. And then uh, it says in 49, up there, how many think themselves great kings who will be stuck like swine here in the sky, here in the sty? leaving a name to spit on in contempt. So here, here Dante is also previewing um, sort of like everybody from the tyrants to uh, kings, to people who have power on earth and they think themselves so great in life. And, and there's a little bit of irony here because Virgil is like, how many people that think themselves great in life uh, are, are, they kind of have a, um, the state of their soul suggests otherwise. Um, now it does it does raise a a question that we don't have time to answer tonight, but there uh, there is there is kind of ever since Plato there's been this open question of is sin really its own punishment? Like if 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 there is somebody in the world who is taking advantage of rules, maybe manipulating people, doing things the right way or doing the wrong way, um, and getting away with it. You know, externally, we might look at that person and tell ourselves, like, oh, they must be miserable. But are they? How do we know? Like, may, like I, you know, obviously there is such a thing as sort of like psychopaths, um, like people who uh, don't lose a wink of sleep despite their actions. Um, so, I, well, this will be... We'll end on this sort of question, but I want to put it to you guys of where where do you stand currently on this idea that um, sin is punishment in, in itself? That when a human when we deviate from the truth, do we suffer for that? Does everybody suffer for that? Or is that just a fiction we tell ourselves? Desmond. Are we allowed to answer it? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. No, I was thinking. Uh, there was a, there was a scripture where God. It's, it's like in Romans where God said, like he he because of the way the people were sinning, he kind of gave them up. So we just kind of left them to their own devices. So they reap the rewards of their sins. So I think kind of if you are doing things that are wrong, you're gonna reap the benefits of what you're doing. Um, even sociopaths, like I don't know, like 
Jeffrey Dahmer, for example, you know, like he went around killing people and, you know, like he got away with it for a while, but he still was a miserable person. And then he ended up in prison and being murdered and he ruined his life and so many other people's lives. But I mean, it was just through his own actions and things that he was doing. So I don't think there's, there's always a consequence to whatever it is that you do. Like if you're a, I like, like haters on, on social media, you know, people that just shoot hate to people, they're still like, you know, they're, they're still receiving the rewards of them being just negative, the negative energy that they have. Yeah, there's this, uh, there's this like idea that the crime returns to the culprit. Um, but I, but I think it's a question of timing. Um, and so it's like how, you know, it does raise questions of fairness. Say, for instance, you get away for, you get away with it for a while, for a long while, and your punishment doesn't come till you are almost out of this earth. How, how, like, you know, you could argue that the, um, if, if they're more psychotic in nature or like maybe they don't, there's, there's something where they don't, they don't suffer. They don't, they don't lose sleep. They don't think what they're doing is wrong. They've sort of justified these things to themselves. Um, I don't know. I don't have a great answer. I don't have an answer for this, but it's something that I find myself wondering often, actually, of uh, like, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And I'm not saying like, I think it's also beyond my comprehension, right? I, like this, there's a, there's a, um, in Lord of the Rings, when uh, Frodo and Gandalf are looking down on Smeagol, there's a point when Frodo basic basically they're like talking about why why not to kill Smeagol, and Gandalf looks at Frodo and he says, "Not all not all who uh, die deserve death," and then he basically says, he talks about justice and the idea of justice. And he says, "But who are you to give it to him?" So there is a recognition that as a human being, I'm not in any position to uh, divvy out justice from that perspective. Um, but it, this is a question that human beings have been, you know, Plato's Republic comes to mind here. This is kind of the forefront of Plato's Republic is, is it better to uh, seem to be just or actually be just? And that's, that's where this question all sort of like comes back to. Shinoa, you got to say one thing in this class. <laughs> I don't have like not on this topic I mean I have questions about things like earlier you mentioned like and I'm sorry like what I'm reading for is a different translation and okay. it's very thick and it's taking me a bit, bit to get through but, like you mentioned like he's there for Beatrice and like when I read through Beatrice like that section you know it's like I felt like she came she was bidding for him so I'm like the why of he the why he's there you just mentioned today, but I'm like, did I miss that? Like, I thought it was kind of like, he's learning still. So I don't know if that's something we can discuss more, but I was curious about that. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, so he is, he is absolutely learning still. And um, it's, I shouldn't say it's why he's there. It's his motivation to make the journey. Um, so that's like where he draws his strength is from sort of the paradise of love. When every, we'll see it a few other places, but every time he hesitates and is having second thoughts, Virgil pulls his attention towards the Beatrice that waits him in paradise. But it's this idea that like it's it's love that moves all the things. And so it's it's Virgil's way of saying your love for Beatrice is the the best possible sampling of the love that God has for you that you can have as a human being. And so he's trying what he's trying to do is use something Dante can recognize. Uh, to give him a window into a transcendent love that he will not recognize until he gets there. We can talk more about it now. All right, our time, we went about seven minutes. Blake, what, what do we think? Yeah. We got to hear from uh, you. Yeah, sorry, I jumped on late. Uh, All good. I, my biggest takeaway is how you quoted Frodo in the Lord of the Rings from Heart, like with no issue whatsoever and i'm like well how the heck am i supposed to remember this and you've remembered it for like 20 years <laughs> this is this is the sword that was <laughs> I have to. I have to. Uh, all right guys i appreciate you all so very much um 
there's a number of folks that are watching on YouTube and kind of following along. So there's going to be a little bit of in and out as we do this week to week. Um, I appreciate those that sent feedback. I appreciate it last week. Send more feedback. Uh, we didn't do as quite as much group discussion um, as I wanted to, but uh, we did make a decent amount of progress. So, um, yeah, feel free to shoot, shoot more questions, shoot more feedback. Um, and otherwise, uh, I will see you all next week. Much love. Thank you all Peace. so much. Thank you, Noah. Thanks, Noah. Yeah. Appreciate it.